Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Barry Prentice. I, I'm the director of the Transport Institute, and I'm very pleased to uh, see everyone here this morning. Uh, in fact, one of the great advantages of a webinar is uh, we don't have to trudge through the snow, and we got a lot of it here in Winnipeg this morning, so uh, it feels good to be in a webinar. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Martin Scanlon to uh, welcome everyone to the university. Dr. Scanlon is a professor and dean of the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences at the University of Manitoba. Uh, Martin, over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Barry. So welcome everyone to the University of Manitoba, but also welcome to the 27th Field on, Fields on Wheels Conference. Once again, being held as a free webinar, thanks to the support of the conference's sponsors. So the theme for Fields on Wheels for this year is supply chain risks, disruptions and adaptation. And the conference today is going to examine some of the challenges associated with supply chains, adaptations to the, to the pandemic are now giving way to adaptation due to extreme weather events. And so um, the whole of agricultural supply chains is actually now tackling with how to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions. And that's invariably going to affect both production and trade in grains. Trade, uh, as, as will be discussed today, remains an important part of the supply chain. And so in terms of trade, the federal announcement, the uh, federal government's announcement of the soon to be opened agri-food center in Southeast Asia is indicative of the importance of trade in grains with Southeast Asia for the food security in that region. And I'll, I'll put in a plug for the University, uh, the Association of Universities of Canada for the February 2023 Singapore um, uh, Asian Pacific Foundation Canada event, which is going to deal specifically with agri-food trade and innovation. Now, recognizing that there are important relationships between land, plants and food, and the supply chains that transport that, that food, and the fact that land and food are central to indigenous identity and ways of knowing, I'd like to welcome everyone here to the Fields on Wheels conference by making the land acknowledgement on behalf of the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences and also the University of Manitoba. So the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Ishinaabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, the Dakota, and the Dene people. It's also the homeland of the Métis Nation. And we respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So with that acknowledgement, I'd like to welcome everyone to Manitoba and, and hand it back to you, Barry, and for a successful conference today. Thank you very much, Martin. And uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Mark Hemmies, who will be our chair in a moment. Uh, but I, I decided that I would give a, a fervent overview of what the day is going to be about and, and why we came up with this as a, as a uh, theme. Uh, for today's uh, Fields on Wheels. So I'm going to just uh, have a few slides here. So uh, the theme, as Dr. Scanlon has said, is supply chain disruptions of the food systems. And, and this is a, an overview uh, that I'm going to provide. Uh, first of all, you know, we don't have any shortage of food in Canada. We're, we're very fortunate. In fact, we're a, a major exporter of food and and with the exception, I suppose, of seasonal fruits and vegetables, uh, we are self-sufficient in just about everything we need. We also have a, a very sophisticated uh, logistics system and, and transportation uh, system for moving food and distributing food and storing food uh, for our population. So uh, typically, we've never really felt any problems of disruption uh, in our food system. Of course, the pandemic came along and suddenly uh, we found a lot of places where there seemed to be weakness. Uh, the specialization of production, of course, people working close together was an issue in terms of uh, the uh, contagion of the uh, pandemic or COVID-19. Uh, but, you know, world scale plants are efficient and it's really hard to uh, go to something that is uh, 
smaller that and more dispersed, which might be safer, but uh, not as efficient. Uh, of course, we also found that this uh, importance in disrupting the supply chains, because again, people uh, working in the distribution centers were also a part of, the, of that uh, effect. Uh, frontline workers, certainly the food distribution and retail, uh, we saw lots of disruptions there, uh, as well as uh, in the logistics and warehousing. Some of the unexpected things happened, and this is uh, some, a topic that we're going to hear more about. Uh, one, of course, was, you know, the restaurants closed. All of a sudden, we didn't uh, have a market for uh, McCain's French fries, and uh, they, they really don't uh, work at the retail level in, in uh, 50-pound bags. So suddenly, we had disruptions in food supply chains that we didn't anticipate. Uh, we also had some interesting side effects. The, uh, the mere fact that we didn't need as much gasoline and therefore not as much uh, ethanol from corn to uh, uh, blend with this gasoline meant that about 33% of Ontario's corn production uh, didn't have a demand. And, and suddenly Ontario went from being a, an importer to an exporter with an impact on prices uh, uh, for livestock that was uh, not seen before. Uh, we even had issues, uh, uh, disruptions where suddenly we couldn't get the, the packaging. Uh, the yellow bags that we're familiar with on the store shelves uh, just weren't available. And of course, uh, we did do some pivots and, and work with this, but uh, again, these are things that weren't anticipated. And also other disruptions, uh, uh, baby formula and other things that came along that again, nobody anticipated uh, these changes. <laughs> and finally, of course, panic buying, which uh, sort of uh, brought us to the end of our innocence as to what can happen when, uh, when things go wrong. So uh, we do say though, that risk and uncertainty are very different. This is a, the black swan, which we, we don't ever expect to see, but uh, it doesn't mean it can't happen. And this chart sort of looks at the nature of disruptions and the impacts. And, and we're gonna discuss some of these ones that are in the, the red stars. These are our global disruptions. Uh, climate change and geopolitical conflicts, uh, the pandemic I've mentioned, fuel costs and interest rates. These are all impacts which are global in nature. And of course, some of them are, are much more devastating than others, but there's many sources of disruptions uh, that we see. In terms of the environment, uh, we do know that climate is changing. Uh, the picture on the left is the uh, 1985. This is the amount of ice cover that was multi-year in red. Uh, today, that's just a very thin strip. And of course, the more that the ice melts back on the Arctic Ocean, uh, the, the warmer our summers are going to become. Uh, we, we've already seen this happening. Uh, we've also seen, of course, that uh, warmer weather uh, produces more evaporation off the oceans, more rain. And on our right is an example of uh, some of these storms that we had not prepared for. Uh, our infrastructure is designed for what is within reason or, or expected. And of course, when something more happens, uh, the infrastructure isn't going to withstand it. Uh, we also see lots of other water problems, uh, floods, occurring in Pakistan, uh, hurricanes hitting Florida, and uh, the Mississippi uh, River, and same time suffering a drought, and, and we're going to hear more about that in our, in our course of our day as well. Agricultural production issues, uh, uh, we're used to seeing bird flu happening. Uh, it seems to be progressing, but there's other concerns in addition to drought, and, and even the question of whether our pollinators uh, are going to be healthy. So issues in agriculture that, that may yet be uh, uh, very important to us in the future. Uh, the macroeconomic disturbances, well, we all know these. I, I looked up, you know, 27 years ago when the first Fields on Wheels came about, uh, lettuce was 51 cents a head. Everybody knows what it is today. Uh, gasoline was uh, 52 cents a liter, and we all know it's about three times that. So. Uh, we've seen lots of inflation. Maybe these prices will come back down again, uh, but certainly uh, amongst others are these interest rates which are going up and these macroeconomic disturbances certainly have an impact on supply chains. Uh, geopolitical conflicts, uh, 
are not new, I suppose, but they seem to be more intensified uh, than they they have been for several decades. And certainly after years of removing and, and reducing the kind of trade barriers that uh, we had uh, uh, seen prior to the Second World War, uh, now we're seeing this returning in the last decade. And, and we'll also hear more about that in our presentations today. But not all disruptions are bad. You know, there's also what we call good disruptions, uh, which are in technology, which is coming about to change the way we do things. So as much as we do have uh, disruptions, uh, we also have ways of, of dealing with them. And we're, we're embracing new ways of dealing with things to reduce the impact of disruptions and to make uh, our Air, our supply chains more resilient. So with that, I will stop and uh, I can figure out how to stop sharing. That's happened already. Uh, and I will uh, introduce Mark Hemis, who is going to be the chair of our first session. Uh, Mark is a uh, well-known to this audience. Uh, he is the uh, president of Quorum uh, and the Grain Monitor. Uh, perhaps one of the most knowledgeable people in the grain industry. And it's a pleasure to have Mark uh, chair our sessions. And so, Mark, if you're there, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks a lot, Barry. <clears throat> I'm uh, I'm not going to give one of my very uh, intense graphic presentations, but I just will introduce this idea in the transport lessons from the pandemic from the perspective of the grain industry. And the pandemic actually started off with probably one of the best years of production and movement that we'd seen. The 2021 crop year was a great year, um, especially for the first three quarters of it. We, we despite the, the fact that the world was in a pandemic situation, the demand for Canadian grain was really good. We saw, um, record set <clears throat> in many in many parts of the system. But that was immediately followed that by the time we got to the fourth quarter of that crop year with a whole series of forest fires that decimated towns, took the rail lines out of commission. Um, and no sooner had the railways got their lines back in condition, we ended up with uh, a flood in the lower mainland and through the Fraser Valley all the way up to Kamloops that took out highways and the railways that again decimated much of the farmland in the Fraser Valley. Um, and then a cold winter. Um, on top of that, we had a drought. Um, so one of the best years that we've seen in 20 years was followed by the worst year we'd seen in 20 years. All that while the pandemic was going on. So um, that's basically what we're going to talk about in this session. So I'll, I'll start off by introducing the first speaker. And I, I don't know, uh, Barry, whether this is uh, where you're going to to jump in and keep your your uh, presentation going, uh, or if you've just given it. <laughs> No, Mark, I think I've uh, set it up and uh, I'd leave more time for others to, uh, to present and, and for questions. Okay, good, thanks. Um, our first speaker then is gonna be Bill Campbell. Um, I, I see his name in the list. So if the host could, could bring Bill uh, into the session. And our second one is Elizabeth Hucker, who's with Canadian Pacific Railway. Um, well, we can't use an excuse like stuck in the snow. <laughs> he is on a farm. <laughs> well, I know that Elizabeth is here. So Elizabeth, uh, do you mind if we start with you? No, not at all, Mark. Good morning. Uh, hey, I'm just going to int introduce you very quickly. Um, Elizabeth Hucker became the Assistant Vice President of Sales and Marketing for CP for Canadian Grain in 2022. In this role, she's responsible for commercial customer relationships and product marketing for CP's Canadian Grain franchise. 
Elizabeth joined CP in 2001 and has held positions in marketing and sales and customer service, touching all of the commodity CP ships, most recently is the AVP of Energy, Chemicals and Plastics. Elizabeth sits on CP's Women's Leadership Network Steering Committee. She holds a Bachelor of Commerce with honors from in marketing from the University of Ottawa. And she let this little note slip that she's actually a third generation railroader. So uh, from a family perspective, railroading isn't anything new to her. At that point, Elizabeth, if I could ask you to start sure. your presentation. Thanks. Of course. Of course. We're going we're gonna to test this out. I have two little girls who are probably better with technology than I am. So I'm going to hope I'm going to share the right screen from a presentation perspective here. Perfect. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, you're fine. Perfect. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak at the Fields on Wheels event, specifically talking about resiliency in the supply chain, which is a topical conversation uh, that is going on in the industry right now. I'll start with just a slide on um, forward-looking information. So my presentation does contain some forward-looking information, and it, for those who are very interested in reading, this is available on CPR.ca, but in essence, what it says is that actual results could materially differ from what I speak about here today. And so just making sure that everyone is encouraged to read the slide or our annual report for further information. One of the areas where I wanted to start <clears throat> when talking about resiliency in the supply chain in Canadian Pacific Railway is specific to our safety record. Everything when it comes to transporting goods, whether it be grain or hazardous commodities or intermodal and automotive is about safety and safety has to be paramount and it's a part of one of our five foundations at Canadian Pacific Railway. And here we're proud to have the best train accident record in the industry for the last 16 years straight. As I mentioned earlier, it's a foundation at CP and one of our five pillars of our business, which include operating safely, optimizing assets, controlling costs, providing service, and developing our people. We have a very unique program here at CP, a safety program called Home Safe. And it's a very simple program with a mindset focus to ensuring that everyone is responsible for the people around them and ensuring that we all go home safe each and every day. And that extends not only from our operating team in the field, but also here in our head office. I know last week, for instance, I had a home safe moment with someone who was walking around face in their phone, texting, and just making sure that everyone has the opportunity to go home safe. I stopped the individual, asked for their commitment to safety, uh, and we both agreed that it was important for them to be able to go home safe and not necessarily bump into someone, a wall, or otherwise from that standpoint. And so what I would say is that our safety results are a testament of the strength of this program, as evidence in what I did last week as well, and the importance of safety to all of us. It is a core foundation and something that I would say is core to every CP employee from that standpoint. Moving from our safety record, let's talk about grain, why we're all here today. At CP, it is our single largest commodity. We often say that grain is in our DNA and it's foundational to our Western Canadian business. As you can see on the slide, grain represents about 22% of CP's business <laughs> and about two thirds of the grain that we move originates in Canada with a third in the United States. That fact alone actually makes CP's network a very unique network among other class one railroads as we are the only one with significant originations on both sides of the border. It acts for us as a natural hedge when there's a commodity or a crop condition in one region of our network versus the other. And case in point, as Mark talked about, is the 2021-2022 drought in Western Canada we actually moved to CP a significant amount of corn from our US network to feed the Canadian herd in Western Canada. Today, I'm gonna to focus on the work that we're doing at CP to continually drive the value of the capacity for our Western Canadian grain franchise. We've developed an industry leading 8,500 foot HEP program and have transformed our fleet with new hopper cars and together with our customers, our grain network is being transformed for the future. Coming into this year's crop, we were well positioned to move the grain and grain products 
and have been executing to our plan to move this crop. The plan that we submitted to the government earlier this year calls for CP to supply about 6,000 hoppers each week. It's all in CP supplied equipment. And that's from about August to mid-December. And again, next year in 2023, from April to July. This is, of course, subject to market demand. And when the port of Thunder Bay uh, is closed, which is upon us, that supply will reduce down to just over 4,300 carloads. In addition to the supply forecasts, we also anticipate moving about 1,050 grain product cars each week. These are different from our whole grains in that it's actually moved in customer supplied equipment. Um, and this is also moving throughout the year, irrespective of the Thunder Bay closure. And of course, as well, those numbers are subject to market demand. Overall this year, we expect to move more than 30 million metric tons of grain and grain products during the crop year. Um, and this is subject to a couple more variables other than just market demand, of course. We're watching very closely inbound corn to Alberta. Is that gonna be a strong demand market uh, as it was last year in the drought? And then of course, global supply chain disruptions associated to the Ukraine-Russia conflict and how that might have impacts on the movement of grain and grain products uh, that are being exported from the Canadian market. As I mentioned earlier, one of the initiatives to ensure that we've got resiliency in our supply chain that CP is tremendously proud of and continuing to work with the industry on is our 8,500 foot high efficiency product. We call it our HEP train. <clears throat> this is our premium product uh, for the movement of grain and is a key reason as to why we have been able to grow our target uh, that we supplied to the government of 6,000 cars per week in the peak. In 2018, we introduced this product, like I said, known as the HEP train model. And it's a premium rate and service product available for facilities that can meet the following three criteria. They can load the length of the train, so the 8,500 foot train. They can do so in less than 16 hours, and they need to be able to receive and return the train completely off CP's main line. The train will ship as an to an 8,500 foot capable facility that again has a 16 hour unload capacity. So as you can imagine, it's a complete loop that just moves, stays together. We don't break up the train or otherwise. And so this premium service is really around and focused to how the locomotives are handled. As I mentioned, it's that continuous loop and we call the service power on for that reason. This means the locomotive stays throughout with the train throughout the loading process and isn't disconnected. So if you can imagine, the CP crew pulls the train into the facility. Our crews jump off and the elevator crews get on and use the CP power to load the train. When the loading's complete, the CP crew returns to the train. We do a safety inspection, and then the train departs to the destination. And there are truly a number of different benefits to this model. The first is that the shippers or the grain companies use CP's power and therefore don't need to use their own locomotives at the elevator. The second is the air braking system stays charged because the locomotive is never broken up. It's that continuous cycle, as I spoke of earlier. And as we go into winter, nobody's late because for snow, uh, as Barry said earlier, uh, but in the cold winters that we experience here through Western Canada, this is a significant benefit because there are often challenges when you need to recharge the air brake system in the cold weather. And this model completely avoids those delays and issues. The third benefit is that the train can depart as soon as it's loaded. There is no delay associated to waiting for a new set of power to be remarshaled and sent out to the elevator, which are often located in remote and hard to reach territories, particularly in winter as cold storms and heavy snow rolls in through the territory. With the 8,500 foot model, we're seeing about round trips to Vancouver as low as seven days. And, and that's significant when you think about where we are and, and are with some of our standard grain trains, where those transits can take up to 10 or 11 days. <clears throat> in addition to this, with the investment in our hopper fleet, this further boosts the amount of grain that can be handled per train launch which in the new generation cars, we have over 6,200 of those that are in CP service. 
and are allowing the shippers and the grain companies to load an average of 4.5 tons more per car since we started this. Um, and we will get the last of our investment, receive the last of our cars here by the end of the year. The total investment that we've made in this program is more than $500 million from that standpoint. So a significant investment in capacity and thereby building the resiliency of the supply chain. With our 8,500 foot HEP program, we can get approximately 174, 70, 100, rather, sorry, 147 cars in one of these trains, which allows us to move approximately 15,000 metric tons to port in one train. So if you step back and think about it, to give you an idea of the incremental gains that we've made between the new hoppers and the HEP program, just by increasing the size of the cars in our current train model, our grain trains are handling over 15% more grain. And when you think about this and add it to the 8,500 foot HEP model, we're actually increasing the amount of grain that we're handling per train by 40%. And this amount of shipping could fill a Panamax vessel in three to four trains rather than five, which you see with the traditional model. This will increase, as we're talking about today, the reliability and resiliency of the supply chain and reduce the vessel anchorage. It is also an make sure that the empties are getting back to their elevators faster, making more room for grain deliveries in the peak shipping months. In our opinion, this is a huge capacity gain for shippers that have invested in these HEP qualified facilities. We have created a premium product for our grain shippers, which provides the highest of incentives, great capacity, and the most efficient service for the grain movements. In the future, we look, as we are delivering today, we continue to work with the industry to be ready for innovation in the future years as we have done in the past. And just one uh, little snippet that I would point to here on the slide is right now we'll have approximately 40, or we have rather, approximately 45% of our network have qualified. Uh, and by the end of 2023, we're looking to be almost 50% of our network. I'm gonna pivot a bit and talk about what's been going on in, so far in this 2022-2023 crop year. As you can see by the graph on the screen, CP has ramped up quickly in this crop year. <clears throat> I would almost say that we went from zero to 60 this fall when demand really quickly ramped up. And it, when you think about the ramp up, you need to take a look at what was going on in those weeks 46 to 50 in the previous crop year. That was some of the lowest shipping periods that we have seen in any of our data set maybe even 10 or in the last 20 years. And so when the harvest began earlier than the industry expected and forecasted after some very favorable and lovely warm weather in the last half of August, we were called to mobilize cars, locomotives and resources early, and we ramped up as quickly as possible. We spotted, as you can see again in the graph, we spotted as many cars in week seven to nine, so those last three weeks of September, as we have ever done in any period in the past. And we moved more grain into position for unloading than we have ever done in those same three weeks. We really did see record levels of grain at the ports. And this is supported when you look at, the, at what happened in October. October for Canadian Pacific Railway was an all-time record for the monthly movement of grain, we hit about 3.14 million metric tons of grain and grain products that were shipped in that month. And so when we step back and look at what we communicated in August, both to the industry and to the government, in our grain plan, we talked about that we would supply 6,000 grain hoppers per week to the country elevators, as I mentioned earlier. And after the first two weeks of the harvest wrap up, that week six, week seven, we have met that expectation in every week since week eight. So what I would say to that though, is that CP's ability to deliver is dependent on the performance of the entire supply chain. This is railways, terminals, and ports. At customer facilities, we have seen some delays from that standpoint, but we continue to work with all of the different stakeholders um, to look for opportunities to improve the supply chain, add consistency and resiliency to make sure that we are all positioned as an industry to move the crop 
to the demand markets predominantly in the export. And so as we think about what that looks like and step back and reflect on the long-term vision for the supply chain, we know and recognize that the supply chain is only as strong as its weakest link. The performance in one of the links in an integrated supply chain will invariably impact others and the overall performance of the system. It's the role of not only the railroads, the grain shippers and the ports, it's all of our roles to collaborate on opportunities to make the Canadian supply chain more resilient and more competitive vis-a-vis -vis Australia or other markets from that standpoint. And as I talked about, the 8,500 foot HEP program is a perfect example where we have come together to build resiliency and efficiencies into the supply chain. As you can imagine, in some instances, trains from Alberta are making it to the coast in 48, 72 hours. And as you're looking to do that and supply to those high peak demand months in October, and November, December, the 8,500 foot prog program is tremendously powerful in an ability to do that quickly and not worry necessarily because you've got, the, you need less trains to fill the Panamax. And so it can be done more quickly, thereby reducing, like I mentioned earlier, vessel birth, but also potentials of vessel demerge. So we're continuing to look and work with the industry to find areas for improvement. I think the biggest one that has been very topical so far this crop year is loading vessels in the rain in Vancouver. So if grain can't be unloaded at the port terminals because of rain, whether that's full days or shifts lost, then hopper cars can't be cycled back to the in-country elevators to be relo reloaded with grain. And these delays have cascading impacts through the entire supply chain, reducing the system's overall throughput and capacity. Similarly, we need to make sure that we're working to make sure that all cars are being loaded at the elevators efficiently, as if there's delays associated to crew shortages or other issues, the entire supply chain cannot be maximized and we can't uh, maximize the total output of the supply chain as well. What I do want to just give a quick little update on, uh, I know that John Harmon was here last year speaking about the CPKC merger, uh, is that we are continuing down that path. Uh, we do expect, uh, subject to regulatory approval from the Surface Transportation Board in the United States, uh, that we will come together as a single organization in the first quarter of 2023. So from a timeline perspective, the STB public hearings occurred in Washington this fall. Uh, this was the final round of hearings for any comments or presentations or concerns. And like I mentioned, the STB approval decision will come in Q1. And if approved, the voting trust will be terminated, which is what we're in with the KCS right now. And CP will acquire the last of the voting shares and take control of the KCS at that time. Again, like I mentioned, we expect this to happen around the end of the first quarter. And as we've talked to the different grain and grain shippers, um, they're very interested and excited in this merger and the ability to access new markets through a single uh, carrier haul. So today, in order to ship wheat from Western Canada to Mexico, you would work with the CP, CP would work with KCS, and then KCSM to access those Mexican markets. When this comes together uh, and we receive regulatory approval, it'll be a single CPKC able to originate from Western Canada and terminate all the way down into Mexico, creating efficiencies and reducing transit times uh, and making Canadian products available to new markets through those areas. I did just want to pause and talk a little bit, given the topic of my presentation, to talk about resiliency. You can see on the slide here six different events that have happened incredibly over the last 18 months. <clears throat> And what CP is doing is we're looking to undertake historical levels of capital investment to improve safety, increase capacity, and enhance resiliency of our overall rail network. Over the past decades, CP has invested more than $14.3 billion into our infrastructure, technology, and rolling stock. This year alone, we will invest $1.5 billion, which represents about 20% of the revenue that we earn as an organization. 
Throughout the pandemic, which we all talked about uh, earlier, CP kept our people working and we pushed hard on capital programs across the network when the train traffic was lower, taking the opportunity to strengthen the railway and enhance capacity to be ready for the rebound and the growth. And truthfully, this has really served us well over the past year and our resiliency in the face of climate change has been tested several times, as I mentioned, over the last 18 months with these six pictures on the slide. In BC alone in 2021, we had to overcome extreme wildfires, flooding, and catastrophic infrastructure damage, all while maintaining high COVID absenteeism. And then earlier this year, severe cold warnings were quite commonplace uh, in Western Canada, experiencing them here in Alberta, particularly uh, in Alberta, like I mentioned, where we were at minus 40 uh, degrees with wind chill. And that was a common occurrence, which is different from Alber in Alberta. Typically, we go cold, but we only do it for a short period of time. And a lot of that cold earlier this year was sustained. Um, and what I would say is that we had the weather event earlier this year, and we were further tested when the Omicron wave then swept across the country in the same period. Um, but we were resilient. And by the end of February, we were caught up on our grain orders and sitting well with all of our customers across a variety of different commodity lines. Our response as well to the flooding in Manitoba was quite swift. We built on capital upgrades that we had made in 2019 and 2021. And with a strong collaborative working relationship with the province, we were able to prevent a rail closure by completing a couple of very quick track raises in early May over the Canadian US border that allowed CP to maintain our railway operations throughout the flooding event this year. So during January and February of 2020, our operations were impacted by the cold weather that I already mentioned in the previous slide for about six weeks. Our winter performance though has dramatically impacted or not impacted rather, improved uh, since 2013, which is attributed to the increase in operating efficiency and fluidity on the network and significant capital investments to upgrade infrastructure. For example, as we grappled with the unprecedented disruptions in 2020, our winter performance in January and February was significantly better than our performance in 2013 during all other seasons. For example, spring, summer, and fall, when operating conditions are more favorable. Train lengths increased by 19%, train weights increased by 25%, and network velocity increased by 14%. And these metrics demonstrate the creation of significant additional capacity on the rail system and improved customer service during the challenging winter months. Although we've made significant improvements to winter operating performance and resiliency, it, it must be recognized that winter performance is fundamentally a function of physics and safety. And so much like winter weather unavoidably causes delays, um, causing longer commutes for cars and trucks on highways and delays for airplanes that need de-icing to ensure safety, winter weather will always impact railway operations as it impacts each of our daily lives. And that's really the reality of operating in a cold weather climate. So to ensure safe railway operations when temperatures are below negative 25 degrees Celsius, a train's speed and length and weight must be reduced in order to operate safely. These are just a necessity, but it operationally changes our network and lowers the overall velocity, which can reduce the supply chain shipping capacity. Similarly, the winter storms, which I know we're all watching coming up from the Midwest right now, that cause snowfall and ice require the deployment of significant assets and resources to keep track corridors and yards operational and safe. And that's why continuing to work with the industry overall um, to invest in the 8,500 foot HEP model, the ability to load in the rain, and otherwise is so very important. I'm not going to spend much time here uh, on this slide as I've already really talked about a number of the different things that we've done, talked about the $1.5 billion that have been, was invested in 2020, um, but only to say that, you know, really in 2021, we look to make sure that we were investing in our network 
to set us up for that strong growth that I mentioned. And also looking as much as we put money into the ground, looking to make sure that we were modernizing our locomotive fleets uh, to ensure that we were getting the significant performance and reliability that we needed from them to deliver on the growth and the record crop from Western Canada this year. Moving forward and looking into the ESG space, CP is tremendously proud of our hydrogen locomotive product. All of the supply chains are integrated and we operate in an environment where it's important uh, that we make sure that we are good stewards of the communities and the environments that we run through. And so in our eyes, sustainability and resilience are interconnected. Global sustainability efforts will reduce the impact of climate change, therefore making supply chains more re resilient and effective. On the side here, what you'll see is the CP hydrogen locomotive. And we're very proud to say that on October 28th of this year, we performed uh, our second mainline test and our actual first revenue movement with the hydrogen locomotive. We're developing uh, North America's first line haul hydrogen powered locomotive using fuel cells and batteries to power the locomotive, sorry to power the locomotive um, that will move using electric traction motors. The fuel cells uh, use a chemical reaction to convert hydrogen to water that then releases the electricity needed to power the locomotive. Using this method uh, means that the only emission that will come from this locomotive is water vapor. And the technology that we're using is tried and proven. However, its use in railway applications uh, have been limited. In Europe, it's used more for passenger operations uh, and in the US in light duty freight operations. So we're tremendously excited and proud of this program and there'll be so much more to come in the future. I'd like to thank everyone here today at Fields on Wheels for the opportunity to come and speak about CP's role in a, a resilient supply chain, whether it be working with our customers on the 8,500 foot HEP model, which you'll obviously see here on the screen, working with port operators to load in the rain, thereby reducing the amount of dwell in the supply chain. We all play a key role in making sure that Canada's Canadian grain supply chain is as efficient as and effective as possible in the world markets. Thank you for the time. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth. It's a really good presentation. Um, before we go into the questions, I think what we'll do is we'll uh, listen to Bill Campbell's presentation and then we'll open it up to the floor for everybody to ask questions. I know that a lot of people have put questions into the chat session and that's how we'd like everybody to do it. If you've got questions, put them into the chat sessions and then we'll run through them when we get to the uh, to the question and answer period. But at this time, I'd like to uh, ask Bill Campbell to to join us. Thanks a lot, Bill. I <laughs> We were getting worried there at the beginning, so uh, I'm glad that you were able to to get onto the onto the conference. Um, I'll give you a bit of an introduction, Bill, and then let you take it away. <clears throat> Bill was born in Boiseville. Manitoba, and he's lived all his life on the family farm northeast of Minto, Manitoba. <clears throat> they farm 2,300 acres. His farm has 1,500 acres seeded to annual crops, which is wheat, barley, corn, canola, oats, and soybeans. And he also ran a purebred limousine cattle operation for 50 years. After high school, Bill attended the University of Manitoba and graduated with a diploma of agriculture in 1975. Bill served as the president of Keystone Agricultural Producers in Manitoba since 2018 and has been a member <clears> since <throat> inception. Much of his career has been dedicated to the improvement of the limousine cattle breed. Bill has devoted much time to the Manitoba Limousine Association, serving on its board for over 40 years, as well as serving in many roles, including president of the Can Canadian Limousine Association. Bill has also been a strong supporter of the local area organizations, serving as chair of the Minto Restaurant Committee on the board of directors for the Boyce Veterinary Veterinarian Board, and as a coach and volunteer for many sports over the years. Bill and his wife have 
Lauren have two daughters, Courtney and Caitlin, and three grandchildren. Bill, uh, thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, very interested in hearing your comments. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Um, we, great. You're, you're coming through loud and clear. Thanks a lot. Okay, because I'm a, a bit technical challenged, and this weather this morning has created some uh, adversity at my end, and Hopefully, I, I've had to adapt to my cell phone because all of a sudden my iPad does not uh, want to respond to the server. So uh, I stayed in the city last night. So hopefully we can can make this work and that you can hear me all right and the audio and visual is, is all right. I guess I would just confirm that before I carry on. Looks really good, Bill. Well, well can't I'm tell the difference. <laughs> Good, maybe uh, better. I'm better on radio than I am probably in, in live person. But anyway, so, but with that, I will thank you and uh, apologize for all the challenges at this end with regards to timeliness and concern for the committee and, and that part. But uh, we will move forward and, and adapt the best that we can. So, but good morning to everyone and thank you for having me here today. And uh, the introduction uh, kind of explained a few things of my background, uh, but I'm very proud to be an alumni member of the University of Manitoba and, um, you know, learned a great deal uh, of interaction through the Diploma of Agriculture uh, when I graduated in 1975. And uh, it seems like a long time ago now, but I really appreciate that opportunity. Um, I currently serve as president of Keystone Agricultural Producers and commonly known as CAP. Uh, we are Manitoba's general farm policy organization focused on providing a unified voice for farmers on issues that affect agriculture. And I want to focus my remarks today on the perspective from Manitoba farmers as it relates to supply chain challenges, how we have coped at the farm level with these challenges and how we can improve our supply chain to get Canadian crops and livestock moving as efficiently as possible from farm to the dinner table. Farmers rely on an effective, efficient supply chain to have their product moved to market. Without a supply chain that meets these two qualities, crop and livestock input, inputs are needed by food processors to create consumer products can't reach their processing facilities or foreign markets. The immense challenges to our society and economy that any disruption in this system cannot be overstated. As we have seen over the past few years, the global pandemic, natural disasters and overseas conflicts are already stressing a vulnerable supply chain. The COVID pandemic has had a significant impact on the functioning of global supply chain and the exposed vulnerabilities within it that contributes, continue to be felt across the globe. Increased demand for goods, trade restrictions, record container shipping rates, government shutdowns, factory closures have all disrupted the global supply chain leading increased inflation and shortage of goods. Other recent supply chain pressures have negatively impacted the system which include the blockage of the Suez Canal, empty container shortages, port congestion, full warehousing space and the conflict we are witnessing in the Ukraine. While these are struggles we see today, even when they have passed or been resolved, new challenges are sure to rise up as they always have throughout human history. What is becoming crystal clear during these turbulent times is how critical important it is to maintain Canada's reputation as an efficient, consistent supplier of high quality, nutritious and safe agricultural products. It is important to recognize that geographically, prairie growers are at a disadvantage compared to our global competitors. Prairie grain is shipped up to 2,000 kilometers to reach its export position. This is compared to European countries at around 400 kilometers. 94% of all grain shipped to the US or Mexico is shipped by rail. Some of the ways that farmers attempt to compensate for this disadvantage is through increased on-farm efficiencies and increasing our crop yields. 
If agriculture shippers encounter unreliability, contract penalties, or lost sales, then these costs are often passed back to the farmer. This can be significant given the fact that transporting grain is the largest animal element in the overall cost of production. A constant challenge within the ag sector has been doubt regarding the ability and desire amongst class one carriers to increase capacity to meet the demands of the crop year. While changes to CTA Act have resulted in annual grain plans outlining their expected movement of grain, there are still criticisms of these plans as not necessarily showing tangible service performance data and accountability. In the spring of 2022, Canada's Federal Minister of Transport initiated a national supply chain task force to look at the pressures impacting supply chain network, and they issued a report on these pressures. The recommendations released in their final report are pertinent to Manitoba farmers, given their re reliance on domestic and international markets to sell their commodities and highlight the need for government intervention on issues that cannot be solved by industry and farmers alone. Although Manitoba farmers operate within the whole transportation supply chain, there are a number of recommendations that would be more impactful on agriculture than others. These recommendations include addressing port container congestion, expanding current inter-switching limits, increased government service capacity at ports, addressing the current labor shortage and ensuring border crossings and trade corridors are protected from disruptions. CAP recently met with federal members of parliament from both the government and opposition and have more meetings in the coming weeks to discuss challenges with infrastructure and the supply chain. Our focus in these meetings have been and will continue to be on getting the federal government to implement the recommendations from this report. The task force report represents a long list of reviews on Canada's transportation network. This isn't the first review that has been done as in 2016, the government undertook the Canadian Transportation Act review. What separates this report from previous ones is the boldness in the recommendations and the urgency placed on implementing these recommendations. The task force reported was commissioned under the context of COVID-19 pandemic with the desire to address critical breaking points in the supply chain. The report reviews the transportation supply chain as a whole. Agriculture is part of this integrated and fragile network. However, it is one of the many sectors that is so critically dependent on transportation. One example of the recommendations mentioned included an increase in the current inter-switching radius. This would create more competition in the market and make supply chain more efficient. As you know, inter-switching is a process that allows the transfer of traffic between two railway companies. This is possible if one railway company connects with the railway line of another company. The inter-switching arrangement is made in cases where a shipper has immediate access to a single carrier, but is within a defined distance to one or more of the competing character carriers. Currently, the inter-switching limit is within 30 kilometer radius of an interchange. 6% of inland grain terminals are within 30 kilometer eligible inter-switching radius. And if this was increased to 160 kilometers, 92% of grain elevators would be within inter-switching limits. The existence of inter-switching partly addresses the issue of being captive by either class one railway. Currently only 14 out of 411 grain elevators in Western Canada have access to more than one class one carrier. Inter-switching is viewed as an efficient way of increasing competition amongst class one carriers, and an increase to the radius would not only make the supply chain more efficient, but improve service levels and make more competitive pricing. Another key element or key highlight is the issue of labor, particularly the impact of truck drivers and others in the transportation sector. 
Truck drivers are an integral part of the agriculture sector as they are responsible for shipping grain to elevators, moving livestock to and from auction marts, and transport, transporting food and beverage products to their destination. Certain components of complex machinery inhibit the repair or replacement of important seasonal equipment. This also places an additional financial uncertainty on repair shops and supply systems. Across the country, there is, as highlighted before, this shortage of truck drivers in Manitoba that provincial government provides a grant that covers the full tuition cost of class one driver training. However, this grant does not fill the current labor gap for truck drivers. Recent data has shown that there is currently 55,000 positions for truck driving that need to be filled by 2023. The federal government should be investigating additional policies that would incentivize individuals to enter the trucking industry. Supply chain challenges affect many industries, but agriculture should be of particular concern when we look at them and their effect on the economy and the society as a whole. Agriculture not only puts food on the table with what farmers grow, but delivering jobs for one in eight Canadians. Agriculture also provides $85 billion in exports. Agriculture matters for farmers and those working in jobs that support the sector. Agriculture has the solutions to meet our food security goals at home and abroad while working collaboratively on reducing our environment and climate impact. When consumers see grocery prices continue to rise, it is imperative that they understand why agriculture matters and the effect on these global supply chain challenges. Whether you are from an urban or rural community, agriculture matters because it is all around us. In rural communities, you have farmers and others working on farm like agronomists, equipment, maintenance technicians, veterinarians who support livestock operations. In urban communities, you may have those who work selling equipment and other products to farmers, people working in manufacturing facilities or financial services. The supply chain network is at a turning point. The decisions in investment and policy in the coming years will greatly impact Manitoba farmers. There's a chronic labor shortage across the ag industry, particularly in the trucking industry, as, as I previously mentioned. Trucks are essential in moving product from farm to export markets, and industry groups in the agricultural field must be united in providing a unified voice on issues impacting them within a supply chain. A unified voice on problems and solutions is critical for addressing current problems. Thank you for having me here today. And with that, I would open it up for questions for the time that I have remaining. Thanks a lot, Bill. Um, really good comments and very much appreciated. Um, I'm gonna open it up to questions. I'm gonna start uh, moving my way through the chat session um, and in no particular order, uh, but I'll start off with one for Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth, if you could unmute. Um, for, this question is from Randy Baldwin, uh, and, the, and, and he's asking, are all HEP compliant grain elevators using loop tracks or are other configurations also feasible? So we work with all of our customers to find the design that works best. Obviously a loop in a new build is much easier or if you have a significant land position but we do have some of our facilities that are ladder tracks or a very long lead track um, on cpr.ca and i'm happy to distribute to the organizer for further distribution we have a document that talks about the 8500 foot requirements from that standpoint um, but we do have i would say about 39 inland elevators at this time that are have qualified and that's a combination of ladder tracks, long leads, and loops. And kind of keeping with the HEP um, line of questioning, Scott Kinsman has asked, to fill an 8,500 foot HEP train, that's an incredible amount of 
grain to be loaded in a very short period of time. How many Western Canadian inland grain terminals are actually capable of handling the loading requirements of the HEP train in 16 hours? Yeah, so today that's 39 different stations, different inland terminals that have the ability to do that today. And that's based upon about 45% of our network. As I mentioned, uh, by the end of next year, we'll be at about 50%. So there's another small increment of growth uh, that'll continue to come. Great, thanks a lot. Um, next series of questions, I'm going to, I'm going to take the moderator's discretion and answer the first part of this question, and then uh, toss it over to Elizabeth. Um, Ed White uh, is asked to describe the particular problems with rain affected grain loading. Um, and, and this is something that we have been analyzing and examining for a number of years. So without going into a lot of detail, essentially what, what happens is, is it rains a lot in Vancouver. A matter of fact, if you took all of the days over the last eight years and said, how much does it actually rain? Well, only 54% of days in Vancouver have no rain. Um, so the other 46%, um, it does rain there. So it's not a big surprise to anybody who's ever been to Vancouver. Um, the problem with loading in the in the rain is is that when you open up the hatch of a a vessel, um, captains of vessels don't like to get any kind of water inside the hold because what happens with grain when you get it wet? It starts to 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 uh, open up or it rots. Nobody wants that to happen, so they have to if they want to load in the rain, they have to tarp it up um, and put or either use a feeder hole, which is not on every vessel that comes into the port. The issue started in about 2007, where the Longshore Union started to refuse to work on the holds of ships um, because they said it wasn't safe. Um, the, the short version of the story is, is after a couple of arbitrations, it was decided that certain procedures had to be put in place in order to load vessels. Um, many terminal management people have decided that the amount of time that's been allowed through the agreements with the longshoremen is just too long to try and load in the rain. So what they do is they try and wait till the rain stops. Where that becomes an issue for everyone is, is in those times, and, and it's not all the time, but usually during the high shipping period, what will happen is, is the terminal elevators storage will start to build up if the rain goes on for more than one or two days. And at that point, um, they can't accept any more rail cars to unload because there's no space in the terminal. Now, I would emphasize that this doesn't happen all the time, but when it does happen, it really affects the entire supply chain. So that's the expl explanation in a very Reader's Digest um, sort of situation. But the question for um, Elizabeth, I think, is, is there an obvious solution to rain stoppages at the port, in your mind? So I, I would say that this is best positioned for the port operators, obviously. From a railway perspective, we want to make sure that we've got a fluid and efficient supply chain, which means not backing up trains associated to as Mark has well described, a lack of elevator space or lack of port terminal space because vessels can't be loaded. Um, earlier this year, we actually had nine trains in one day staged because of the impact of rain in Vancouver from that standpoint. So I do understand though that there are, that industry is already working on this, that there are meetings coming up over the next couple of weeks between government and industry to talk about what a solution looks like. Um, and like I said, our focus remains on making sure that the supply chain is efficient um, and consistently being able to load in the country and unload at port is critical because it is an interconnected to supply chain. And if, I, if we can't generate empties from the port of Metro Vancouver, that means that there's not empties to take to in-country elevators, which then can't be loaded. And so it has a cascading effect. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um... I'm gonna I'm gonna put Bill 
on the spot now. We'll give Elizabeth a break. Um, have the disruptions in the supply chains affected the agricultural production, for example, equipment, parts, supply, or any new equipment availability, Bill? I would generally say yes. They're not necessarily widespread or catastrophic. Uh, but in my conversation with farmers, there have been individuals affected by these um, disruptions in the supply chain. And having a conversation with a local repair shop where uh, some of these uh, components are required from overseas, that he has uh, uh, problem sourcing some of these said parts. And, and it may not be all uh, of those parts, but any one part that's not a available to repair a certain piece of equipment, he's been waiting 18 months for those parts to get that equipment repaired. So that places an undue stress on that shop because he can't invoice until he has completed his task. So we see those carrying charges then relayed back to the farmer. Uh, a certain conversation just the other day with regards to um, new augers are available, but we're having problems sourcing the motors to drive the augers. So, so those are uh, a couple of situations. And we've also heard situations where um, certain size of tires have not been available for new equipment. We've also heard of certain electronic components not being available for complex integrated machinery. And as we move forward with the adaptation to uh, certain uh, technology, variable rate, GPS, um, all of those components require uh, a lot of technical components. So we have seen uh, uh, impacts with regards to supply chain issues. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Uh, kind of keeping to that flavor of the pandemic, um, Elizabeth, how did the pandemic affect the availability to coordinate ship movements with grain deliveries? Or did the drought reduce that impact? Sorry, Mark, just to make sure that I understand the question. Is that with regards to vessels or was it specific to the grain terminals and how we worked with them to coordinate? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. The pandemic mm -hmm. effect on the availability to coordinate those ship movements between the terminals and the railway. So from a CP perspective, we didn't lay off during the pandemic. We made sure to maintain a, an active crew base uh, that was focused on moving commodities uh, during the pandemic. What was a little interesting during the pandemic is, uh, while one commodity might have suffered during that time, another saw strength. So what I would say is, you know, you might have seen uh, less of one commodity, but plastics that was used in single source uh, manufacturing, medical equipment, and those sorts of things there was an increase in demand. And so there were puts and takes across the network from a volume perspective. So we didn't lay off during that time. And so I don't believe now, recall that I only joined the grain team this year, uh, but I don't recall hearing of any issues that existed during the pandemic. To your point, Mark, how much of that was related to the drought and how much the drought uh, resolved Parts of that I can't speak to, but I'm not aware of issues that existed during that time. Again, I'll kind of exercise my prerogative. Um, and given that this is something that we study daily, uh, the 2021, right after the, the pandemic, it seemed with the reduction in volumes in some of the other commodities because of the pandemic, that benefited the grain industry because it opened up capacity on both railways to move things a lot faster and a lot more efficiently. And therefore, that's how we set a lot of records in 2021. The drought hit almost at the same time as fires, floods, et cetera. Um, that had the greatest effect on the movement in the last crop year. And I think, I think that's pretty much goes without saying. Um, Elizabeth, just to follow on that to that though, if you could just, I know that the railways did have quite a few issues regarding staffing through the pandemic. And I think it's worth just making a comment on some of the things that happened um, 
through that time and and some of the things that were done to ensure that service continued. And I think probably not laying off is a big factor in that. I would definitely say so. As a, a federally regulated industry, we were mandated to be fully vaccinated uh, by a certain point and needed to work uh, through our HR and union representatives to ensure that the TNE or the, the men and women that drive our trains uh, and maintain our tracks were fully vaccinated. And so uh, we worked very, very closely with government as well as unions to make sure that the impact to our operations and the individuals that were unable to work uh, was minimized from that standpoint. I would say that we're tremendously appreciated of, appreciative rather of our, st our t and &E staff who, you know, during a tremendous amount of uncertainty, recognizing that a cab of a locomotive is tremendously small and you have two people in there, uh, they came to work every day to make sure that the trains ran and we could move freight, grain and otherwise uh, to markets in demand to feed individuals from that standpoint. Mark, to your point, we didn't lay off during the pandemic. Um, but that being said, uh, coming out of the pandemic, there is a tremendous ramp up in demand from that standpoint. And this year, we have undertaken a very significant hiring initiative uh, throughout North America, throughout our network overall. We have hired as many people, I think the statistic was by July of this year, we had hired as many people in as we had in the full year of 2021. So we're out there making sure that we are hiring and being creative in the way that we are uh, trying to be attractive to the individuals that might come and fill those jobs. So for instance, Revelstoke is a particularly challenging place to hire because of the cost of living. It is an expensive location on our network to live. Uh, and we built housing uh, for the individuals that will come and work in Revelstoke as to help uh, reduce the cost of living in Revelstoke and make CP a attractive employer. And so we continue not only now, but as I look back during the pandemic to be creative uh, and work very closely with our unions uh, to ensure that we have the appropriate staff to run the operations based upon the demand that we see. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth. Kind of keeping in that same vein, Bill, um, I know that a lot of producers um, they spent a lot of time alone. So the pandemic wasn't so much a, an impact for them um, from a human resources perspective, but they still had to deliver grain. Um, your thoughts or comments on, on how some of that started to affect pe producers and people in the industry? Well, certainly any disruption from what has been considered normal with regards to processes that we do in delivery of our commodities um, uh, has had an impact. And, and as we've seen certain features of certain elevators where we were not able to interact and uh, get physical uh, presence with regards to weights and measures and dockage and uh, all of those particular parts, it, it became a bit frustrating to some producers to ensure that what we would delivered was actually what was on that said receipt. And so we all know that there is human error along certain instances, not widespread by any means, but you, you want to be able to ensure that as you deliver these commodities, that there is not that element. This is your livelihood and this is your paycheck. And we, we wanted to ensure that there was that uh, accountability on, on that part. And, and I realized that uh, there was an immediate uh, pressure for some facilities to adapt and change their uh, equipment. And it necessarily did not uh, evolve as quickly as we had in, uh, thought or felt. So there may need to be some of that standardization of equipment requirements at facilities to ensure that we uh, know that what we are delivering with regards to weights and measures is, is what is on our, uh, our receipts. And so, you know, we understand the challenges that everybody went through, uh, but, you know, it's, it's asking for transparency and accountability. And uh, I think 
um, you know, as we move forward, that that still should be a standard that that is um, required and expected. Thanks a lot, Bill. I'm going to move uh, back to Elizabeth. Uh, this is from uh, Chris Claccio. Um Clarification question. Um, Chris says that he ran for mayor of the city of Winnipeg this year, and he knows that there's been conversation about rail relocation within the city of Winnipeg. And would rail relocation interfere with CP operations of the supply chain uh, insofar as moving products? Um, I know that's kind of an industrial development side, not grain marketing, but I don't know if you've got any comments on that. Um, so what I would say to that is, you know, if if a community would like to conduct a study in moving certain rail lines out of a city, um, we we may participate from that standpoint. I, I think there needs, we need to recognize that the, you know, the relocation of a rail yard or rail lines is a very complex and serious issue that would involve not only CP, uh, but local and national customers, regulators, local community organizers, um, and probably all levels of government from that standpoint. And, and an extensive review would need to take place to determine the impact of customer service uh, and the full cost to all stakeholders, which to relocate a line or a rail yard, it, the cost of it can be tremendously significant. So in so much as whether or not that's going to happen or not happen, I'm not entirely sure, but um, CP might look to participate. I don't, I'm not up to date on the Winnipeg file, Mark, from that standpoint. Yeah, I, yeah, I know it was a tough question to, to put forward in this. Um, the only recent example in the last 30 or 40 years that I can think of that happening was in Regina. And that was a fairly mm -hmm. simple move. Yeah. Um, I mean, in Winnipeg, you're talking about motive power shops, car shops, um, supply stations, office buildings, it would be a, it would be a massive undertaking. So I, yeah, that would not even worth comparing to Regina. So no. um, I'm going to switch now. Mary Jane Bennett has asked a question about the supply chain task force bill that you uh, brought forward. Um, it says that you mentioned that the supply chain task force took a bolder view than the Emerson review. And the Emerson review said we should get rid of inner switching as it is based on a system average costing and doesn't sufficiently compensate railways. Are you advocating? advocating to a lower hauling rate than the current MRE? How are railways to pay for upgrades? Should other commodities than grain pay for infrastructure upgrades? Well, thank you for the question. It's a, a three-parter, three I guess. <laughs> a, a fairly complex um, question in so much as that the, um, you know, the task review is, um, analyzing uh, some of these situations. And, um, you know, I think that uh, we've come to realize that competition is the ability to ensure that the most efficient and effective way of uh, transparent uh, costs um, with regards to infrastructure building, there is significant investment by the federal government to uh, be able to increase capacities uh, along that line, um, but you know, we continue to have discussions with the federal government uh, on these particular issues and how to improve uh, for benefit of, of, of everyone along the supply chain issues that uh, we can ensure. There, uh, there just it needs to be that um, awareness throughout the supply chain that farmers want to deliver these products uh, through uh, seasons that do not inhibit efficiencies and how we go about working with elevator companies to, to ensure that they have the product to deliver to the port and railways are our vehicle of transportation that uh, we utilize to get to our customers. Thanks, Bill. Um, short question for, for uh, Elizabeth. 
Um, I, I don't know whether you know the answer to this question. It's from Malcolm Cairns. What's the horsepower of a hydrogen locomotive? I think it's about 3,000, but... Um, it's actually the same as about a SD40 locomotive. So you're right, Mark. It is yeah. uh, 3,000 horsepower. Power. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just, I, I remember that because we asked that in a different session. Um, to Bill, how did the container shortage affect producers? And do you think that the problem has been so resolved? Well, I, I'm certainly like has been mentioned earlier with regards to the production levels of certain um, commodities uh, that uh, maybe have alleviated some part of it, but uh, I believe that uh, the impact on the pulse industry and, and that uh, a confined uh, container to ensure specific commodity is delivered to the purchaser um, is the, the container route that, that has been chosen. And um, I, I guess we haven't necessarily seen complete um, resolution to that situation at this point in time, because I still believe that there is production impacts uh, in Western Canada this year. Uh, so moving forward, if we were to uh, get to what would be satisfied production for all producers, I still believe there may be some impacts with regards to containers moving forward. Yeah, and another another case where it's something that we watch very closely is the grain monitor and it was really bad through most of the pandemic, um, largely because, just to expand on this, largely because uh, that many of the shipping lines decided that they needed the empty containers back in um, the Asia Pacific countries a lot more than they needed any kind of revenue from bulk products that are being shipped out of Canada. Therefore, they demanded that no product be loaded in Canadian containers and to expedite the movement of empty containers back to Japan, Korea, China, Indonesia. And because of that, um, the bulk industry, which really affected the, the Pulse products being exported from Canada were severely impacted. And that hasn't entirely corrected itself. I think it's still gonna be a while before the entire container industry through North America has found its way back into a balanced cycle of containers. So uh, just adding on to Bill's answer there. Um, next question is from Bo Wen. Um, as the geopolitical situation deteriorates, more and more goods around us are being made in Vietnam or Bangladesh instead of China. Will this have a significant impact on Canada's supply chain system, good or bad? Now, another person who's part of this, this uh, uh, panel is Barry. And I'm going to start with Barry, and then I'll go to Bill and Elizabeth. And you, you all can, I think this is a question that's posed to all three of you. Barry. Yeah, well, to some degree, uh, the mere fact that we're getting more trade with Bangladesh uh, and or, and with uh, Vietnam means that we're going to have more containers going back. So that actually is a benefit in terms of, of our trade because we can explore new markets. And, and certainly what we've seen in China has been certain trade uh, barriers that have been presented, as has India. And we're going to hear more about that later on in the conference, so I won't comment further now. But I think to the degree that we see a diversification of these markets, it actually is a very good thing. And we'll likely see, you know, again, less risk because you have more places to ship as well as perhaps greater volume. Bill, your thoughts? Well, I guess as an agricultural producer, we have always um, endorsed the uh, increase of trade and new markets and, and new customers. Um, but saying that there's always uh, some logistical uh, challenges with new, new uh, customers. Um, you know, they're, they're quite varied. And with regards to 
um, the pandemic and the disruptions and and uh, supply chain issues that it uh, you know it takes time to build a, a credible relationship uh, with new new customers and and how we can ensure that we deliver as their requests, um, but also we need to ensure that that same responsibility is reciprocated uh, when we um, when we deal at the farm gate level. And, and as you know, if for instance, they require certain specifications to a commodity and we comply and there is these disruptions or, or um, be they market or delivery, it certainly places a huge impact on that primary producer. Elizabeth? So I'm not tremendously well-versed, but at a 10,000 foot level, if production of goods are being shifted from China to, to Vietnam or Bangladesh, um, and Canadian consumption of those goods isn't increasing, it, it should likely just produce a one-for-one -one, uh, when I'm thinking about container supply replacement. And so I don't necessarily know that it would be good or bad because I don't I don't know for certain if it means an incremental uh, increase in demand or a degradation in demand based upon where these are the products are being produced. But if it's if it's the same amount of product just coming from a different location, it won't necessarily change how the supply chain is moving or the availability of containers. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, Chris Ferris, uh, for, for anybody who isn't following the chat session, has actually made a point that at the highest level, the port of uh, Vancouver container flows is still showing a high share of empties on all outbound containers. Um, and he's uh, pointed to a reference uh, with a link in the chat session if anyone's interested. Um, I think that pretty much covers all of the questions one one to uh, everyone and i think more directly to bill because you're probably the closest to this is what's been done to enhance the truck driver availability for manitoba is that are you familiar with an answer to that well it, uh, to some degree and and it, it's um, evolving but i but i know that there has been um some since the consequences of the Humboldt accident, that there has been enhanced requirements to receive class one licensing. So Manitoba has, um, I think, or even other jurisdictions have the mandatory uh, training level. And I know that the Manitoba government had provided some funding for that uh, schooling. Uh, we had advocated that that be uh, uh, outside of the city. And we had also uh, focused on the agricultural community that it be seasonal in its training so that um, appointments and training did not happen through busy seasons so that we had suggested that some of these rural sites be able to accept and uh, train and license uh, these um, through off season, um, be it through uh, summertime or wintertime, or even some online training with regards to portions of the book training. Uh, we also challenged whether or not uh, that a, a driver could challenge the test with previous knowledge and uh, if he could exhibit the driving skills that are required that he would uh, be uh, accepted if he knew and and was uh, able to deal with the criteria that he, that he would bypass that part of it i think there's probably still is room for uh compensation of training we have we have been challenged in so much that the spots have been by uh, professional driving schools they book up large areas of the uh, licensing uh, requirements like when you go for the driver testing uh, so how we get into those spots has been a continual challenge that, that we move forward. But um, it, it is certainly an issue as we move forward when we see large uh, commodity movement through trucks. And, and uh, uh, I think it's been revealed through the pandemic and the, the food inflation that virtually everything that comes to consumers 
has been on a truck at some point in time. And so uh, there, you know, there needs to be that acknowledgement and how do we ensure that we have a strong trucking industry? Good answer. Thanks a lot, Bill. Um, I think this may be the last question um, off of the chat board. Uh, and this is to Elizabeth. What variables, metrics, or indices are CP using to estimate the resilience of the rail system? So the metrics that we would use to test the resiliency of our rail system would be the same as what we use to generally test the what I would call the health of our network. So it's things like train speeds, dwell, uh, time out of service, uh, and those key metrics, which we publicly report on weekly, as well as through our quarterly numbers overall. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to pose the last question to all three. And, um, it's pretty general in nature, and I'll start with Barry uh, and, and go through the three of you. Um, what do you see for the future? Is the pandemic effect going to continue to to affect the system, or are we getting better? Well, again, it depends on what part of it. Uh, as we're going to hear later on in the presentation, you know, there's a lot of different impacts out there, uh, climate change as well as uh, trade issues and so on. and and those are very unpredictable, so it's not clear what we can do. But uh, at that being said, you know, being aware and starting to prepare for them, as uh, Elizabeth has pointed out, is about all we can do. And uh, and and we know things are changing. So I, I suppose, like I made my one of my slides, the age of innocence is gone. You know, we now understand that we have to be ready to respond faster. Uh, we have certainly learned from the pandemic. It's it's not been all bad. I mean, the mere fact that we're having this nice Zoom meeting today is an example of of that. And and so you know, I think we we do learn from this. We become more resilient. And uh, and I'm optimistic for the future that we are going to see a, a calmer period in the future in terms of some of these other issues that have been out there. Elizabeth. So. As far as the pandemic being behind us, I think that there are varying waves and challenges that will continue to come, whether it's a new strain or RSV as we're seeing now, or, or a really big flu season from that standpoint. Um, so I think it's going to be present uh, and continue in a variety of different ways. What I would say is, is it's critical that we don't forget the lessons of the pandemic. And so Barry spoke a little bit about this, is how can we take the things that we learned from the pandemic about being prepared, uh, making sure that we have resiliencies and appropriate uh, redundancies as in order to protect the supply chains that exist and being flexible to ensure that as we look to the future and climate change being the next you know, challenge in front of the world, the industry overall, Canada, how do we make sure that we are, are leading that and have a supply chain overall uh, that is built to, to sustain that next wave that's coming from that standpoint. And I think each of us, whether it be transportation, the farmers, uh, the grain industry overall, we all have a key part to play in that. And I would say the collaboration that I've seen so far, having only joined the industry in the last six months, um, gives me great hope uh, that you know the industry overall is focused on doing what's best overall and moving together as a cohesive unit from that standpoint. Bill, last word. Well, <laughs> well, I I agree with the the previous two uh, panelists in in so much as that uh, I think if, if we don't learn anything and if we don't uh, adopt new technologies from what we have learned, then I, it may be a wasted opportunity. But I think even moving forward, that if we as a society come to consensus about the status of COVID, we still are going to deal with global disruptions uh, and other impacts. And so we will continue to have supply chain issues that, that affect the primary producer. So I think as an industry, we have adapted, we have evolved, and, uh, but moving forward, maybe a, a rather bold statement is that uh, we need to become somewhat more self-reliant 
on the inputs that we need. And we maybe need to look inward as the ability to provide some of those said inputs. We have become reliant on other jurisdictions to provide some of our inputs because of lower cost. But as we move forward with the conversation of climate change and human rights and all of those particular issues, maybe we need to focus inward and, and realize that we need to change our suppliers and, and, we, and we be able to move forward with that. But I remain optimistic because as a primary producer, I continually advocate that humans require food two at least or three times a day, and we still will need food. And there are jurisdictions in this world that do not provide enough production to feed their people. And we as an industry in Manitoba have that ability and luxury of producing more than what we consume. And so we rely on these export markets uh, as a global industry to ensure that we feed the world. And so that is the optimism. Are there challenges? Yes, but we need to be able to address and learn and evolve like the, like the egg, primary eggs industry has done for decades. So I guess in short, you're advocating for nearshoring. <laughs> well, I don't whatever term that you want to do it, but I, but I, as a primary producer, if you haven't got the ability to ac access what you need, sometimes farmers build it themselves. And yeah. that, that research and innovation has been around since this country was settled. Uh, with farmers like uh, you know John Deere built a plow because he couldn't get um, that what he wanted as a desired product we've seen the evolution of air seeder equipment because they seen the need and they built their own in Saskatchewan we have Macdon Industries in Manitoba that uh, noticed there was a need for uh, swathers to deal with harvesting of our equipment so um, we have we have the ability it just it's just you know what so identifying the challenges and then and addressing them so good well um that brings us pretty close to the end of this session um we're giving you a few minutes uh so we'll finish early barry uh i'd like to on behalf of of the university and and, and barry and the fields and wheels people i'd like to thank bill and elizabeth very much for participating in this. Uh, it's been very informative. I, I quite enjoyed um, the discussion. And at this point in time, Barry, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, input as well and, and insights and, and various uh, questions like the, uh, the issue of the rain of Vancouver. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, we're not going to stop the rain, but uh, I think we do have to come up with a solution for, for loading those ships better to, to make sure the supply chain does run. So it's an important issue. It, it also is a, not a bad segue into our next session.